Okay, everybody, welcome to um, today's End to Alive webinar. Uh, today's topic is Ain't No Man Mountain High Enough Climate Change, Climate Warming and Freshwater Insects. And we're really lucky to have Craig McAdam from Bug Life, uh, the Director of Conservation from Bug Life and National Recorder for Mayflies here to deliver this presentation. I've been lucky enough to um, have Craig deliver a number of presentations on webinars I've hosted before and he's a fantastic speaker and I personally approached him for this topic because I think it's going to be um, very eye-opening. So over to you Craig to let us know all about your research on freshwater insects and climate change. Brilliant, thank you Kieran. Um, as, as Kieran said, I'm Conservation Director with Bug Life, the Invertebrate Conservation Trust, and I'm also a Scientific Associate with the Natural History Museum London. Um, I co-chair the IUCN Species Survival Commission Specialist Group on Mayflies, Stoneflies and Caddisflies, and I'm National Recorder for Mayflies and Stoneflies. So they really are my passion, the um, river flies, uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about the effect, uh, the, how climate change affects aquatic invertebrates, particularly aquatic insects. And I'm also going to share with you some of our studies on the upland summer mayfly um, over the past decade. So first of all, a little bit about bug life. So bug life is the only organization in Europe concerned with the conservation of all invertebrates. Our aim is to halt invertebrate extinctions and achieve sustainable populations of invertebrates in the UK. And we work on the wide range of species from, from uh, mayflies to millipedes, spiders to starfish, you know, you name it, if it's an invertebrate, we're concerned about it. <coughs> we, we, we do this, we, we try and achieve our aim by, uh, by several different ways. We, have, we go out there and we inspire others, we go out and talk to them and show them invertebrates and, and get them up close and personal with, with the, the species and tell them about their life histories and their quirky sort of facts about them. Um, we undertake practical conservation. The picture on this slide is of some uh, bog restoration, peatland uh, restoration in central Scotland, where we have uh, re we're restoring 300 hectares of, of bog. But we do other things with wildflower uh, meadows, um, flower-rich meadows, sorry, um, and, and various species-specific actions. We also try and shape policy. We undertake advocacy uh, actions where we go and we talk about the issues that are affecting invertebrates and how they can be solved um, either through practical means or through uh, legislative means. And then we raise awareness. So this, this um, presentation today is one of the, the sort of ways that we raise awareness. We go out and we give talks, workshops and the like um, to members of the public and the other groups. So why are Invertebrates important? Well, quite simply, they are the basis of, uh, of um, many food chains. We have um, around 40,000 species in, in the UK. And that is probably an underestimate um, because very few people actually look at nematodes and mites, and there's probably a lot more species there that we haven't um, identified yet as, as being UK species. If we look at how that relates to other groups of uh, animals and plants. We've got the fungi, which are around about 15,000 species, plants at just under 3,000 species, um, lichens, again, around about 2,000 species, and then a whole bunch of smaller groups, which includes like the amphibians and bats and, and other mammals, um, reptiles. Uh, and, and that's that tiny little bit at the top of that, that pyramid there. Um, the bulk of biodiversity is fungi and invertebrates. Are they important? Well, of course, I'm going to say they're important, but they do. They, they provide so many different um, services for us. They, uh, they've got important ecological roles and provide, uh, they provide food for humans, for instance, and other animals. Uh, one in three mouthfuls of food is pollinated by insects. Um, they recycle nutrients and decompose waste and detritus. And they control other populations of invertebrates and, and plants and, and species that, you know, some people would term as pests. And species such as uh, freshwater pearl mussels and, and other mussels help to clean the water in which they live by filtering out, um, filtering out uh, detritus and the like. In early 2019, there was a, a review published which um, 
set the scene for, for a big discussion about insect declines. Um, this, uh, this review that was published highlighted um, highlighted the, the perceived declines in insects. And there were criticisms of the, the process that they used, that they didn't, they only looked for the declines, they didn't look necessarily for successes and, and increases. Uh, and some some of the hyper, hyperbole in the conclusions was, you know, was criticised as well. But what it did do, it was cause people to actually wake up and 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 see that there was a problem here. The, the report um, uh, uh, concluded that there was around a 41% of species were in decline. Um, some of them threatened with extinction, um, most in rapid decline. And then if we actually look at the detail in this graph here, we can see quite a few of the, the aquatic groups are particularly badly affected. So caddisflies there with the biggest declines and the biggest number of threatened species in this in the study that was looked at. There's mayflies in there, stoneflies, um, dragonflies and, and damselflies. You know, so despite the issues with the review, the findings were clear that some insect groups were in deep trouble. Further studies that have, have been published since um, have, have shown that that's, that is, is the case. This is a study um, in Germany that looked at the um, abundance of insects across a 27 year period. And it found that it declined by uh, um, 75% over that period. And that was the abundance, so that's biomass. You know, so that's not just species numbers, that's, that's actually the number of insects that were, that were around. Our major source of information on extinction threat <coughs> is the IUCN Red List. And a number of freshwater invertebrate groups have had global assessments. 131 species are currently considered extinct, and 34% of the uh, near 8,000 species are considered at risk of extinction. And a further, about a third, are, are, are classed as data deficient. And if you think that that, that data deficient, um, those data deficient species, if only a proportion of those species are found to be threatened, it could push the overall figure to around about 50%. Um, we can see on this graph here that uh, freshwater snails are doing particularly badly, um, with around about a third of them at risk. Um, and what's interesting is the threats that are assigned to these species. Um, so we can see here uh, for freshwater species that pollution is the biggest threat, but there are other issues such as infrastructure and, and water management issues, um, habitat loss, climate change is in there, and that's the one that I'm going to focus on today. So that's the global picture. In Europe, um, we have uh, fewer species that have been assessed on a European basis, but it's the same sort of picture that we've got. Um, some even more dramatic problems for freshwater mollusks um, in there with about 44% of them uh, at risk of extinction. We can see other groups there, uh, terrestrial groups that have got um, high numbers of, uh, of threatened species as well. Um, we don't have any information on the, 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 or rather the river flies haven't been assessed, but there is some information from other studies that, that points to a decline in their numbers. The two graphs on the right show work um, in the Netherlands, research in the Netherlands, that show that caddisflies are, are declining um, or have declined over the last sort of decade or so, and mayflies have as well, although there are some little upticks in the, the, um, the data, which may suggest that there are a bit less, uh, uh, less robust trends in those data. But it's the, the caddis flies are looking at something like a 9% decline in abundance per year for caddis flies, which actually is, is, is a huge amount when you actually think about it in a decadal um, uh, uh, time scale. So taking all that information from the European, uh, from the Red List and from other, other studies, um, we can summarize the, the drivers of decline into five broad groups. And this, was, this is what uh, uh, the IPBES uh, report came up with. Basically, there are five groups of, of, of drivers of decline. Um, we have land use change, so causing habitat loss and fragmentation. We've got exploitation, whether that's for food for humans or food for, uh, or food for other animals, you know, as feed. 
and we've got climate change, which I'll talk move on to in a moment. And we've got pollution, and that could be air for freshwater insects, that's primarily water pollution, but it could also be light pollution, um, which is uh, also a concern for insects that are either drawn away from the rivers um, and don't actually get back to breed or, or the timing of their life cycles are changed. And finally, invasive alien species, um, which outcompete native species or change their habitats. So climate change um, has long been known to affect the environment. And this graphic from uh, a study by Harvey et al um, shows the changes expected between current conditions and those predicted for uh, the, the next century. We can see widespread increases in temperature in the left-hand figures and changes uh, with, change, with the change being most uh, uh, obvious in the temperate regions in sort of like the nor Northern Hemisphere um, and in South America. We, in the, in the center, we can see that that, that has a knock-on effect onto growing seasons um, and the number of frost days, the number of days of cold and, and warm. So our summer days and our frost days are changing which we, we can see ourselves in our, our, our local climate. And then on the right-hand panel, the changes in the amount and timing of precipitation um, across the, the world. And so we're getting less, less rain at certain times of year or more severe rain uh, at particular times of year. So it's, it's uh, those extremes that are the particular problem um, for the environment. Harvey et al. also um, summarized the information about climate change in their paper and um, basically climate change will result in, in increases in extreme events such as floods, drought, fire, which all lead to changes in the occurrence of pathogens and pests and food plants. But what I'm particularly interested in talking about today is the more gradual effects. These ones in the blue at the top here, um, which are things like rain shift, phenology and, and other species interactions. So we can split these effects into, into four broad, well, three broad uh, categories. We can, we can talk about the changes in distribution, whether a species is, is being pushed further uphill because of uh, warming temperatures, um, so that the lowlands are too warm for them, so they've got to get higher up the hills um, to, to, um, to uh, you know, have some habitat that's suitable for them. And we can also talk about changes in distributions in latitudinal terms, that species are being pushed further north away from warmer temperatures in the south. We can also look at changes in phenology, so with the timing of key events in the life cycle of species and how they change and how they may cause different interactions um, as species move away. And the classic one for this is, is the timing of emergence of insects with the timing of the hatching of, of bird chicks and bird eggs. Um, and there's been some really interesting work done on the timing of blue tits um, fledging, um, oh, well, well, not fledging, but um, hatching, and the, um, uh, the availability of small insects for them to feed upon. And there's a mismatch happening there. And then the final thing we can look at is changes in body size. So as a rule, um, it, as temperature increases, body sizes of insects um, decrease. And so that is a good indicator of, of what's happening with the climate as well. We'll start with changes in phenology. So this graphic um, from Frin et al describes different responses to warming. In graph A, the warming results in the peak emergence of the insects occurring earlier in the year. So the blue graph is the normal, if you like, um, without climate effects, and the, the, the orange line is the warmer uh, climate. And you can see that it causes a shift in the, in the timing of the, um, of the emergence of the insects. In graph B, we can see that the warmer temperatures uh, are causing a longer flight period. So rather than shifting it, the the um, the species is able to emerge at different times of the year throughout the year, um, and that's certainly something that we're seeing 
uh, in in aquatic insects, particularly mayflies, that you get longer flight periods than what we have from from textbooks from the 1950s and 60s. Um, they can also be these patterns can be affected by the conditions at the site. So whether there is shading or cooler water entering the river from the groundwater, for example. And you see on the bottom just some examples of how different um, different conditions at the site, whether it's a cool site or a warm site, um, or whether the, the year is a particularly cool year or a warm year, will have sort of uh, more subtle effects on the on the changes in phenology. Changes in distribution. Um, uh, I talked about some of those in the, the previous uh, in one of the previous slides, but this one one of the things that we we know that is happening is that species are not able to keep up with climate change. So those cold species that need to move north are are not adapting and not uh, the range is not shifting in time to keep up with climate change. And this study by Platts et al showed. Um, shows that quite well that we can see that the um the uh the black line the thick black line um on the left hand side is the uh climate between 1976 and 1990 and the dotted line is the climate um now and we can see the yellow bar which represents the current range of the species is not moving at the same pace as the climate change that we are we are seeing and that range lag is likely to be exacerbated as the as the climate continues to warm. And um, there's there's a this is where connectivity in particular of habitats is important so that species can move. And um, we've got such a fragmented uh, landscape that it, it, these stepping stones need to be put in place to allow them to to try and keep up with climate change. We also get changes in abundance. Um, as the previous slide showed, the, 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 there are species that are not moving at the same rate, um, which, which cause them to be gr at greater risk of extinction. If their abundance is changing as well, it, it causes even greater risk. This study by Nash et al illustrates that process quite well. They were actually looking at in the tropics, and they were looking at the richness, abundance, and total biomass of aquatic flies in, in tropical waters. Uh, or around tropical waters and found declines in all three measures with increased water temperature. And you see here on the uh, the left, we can see um, abundance uh, at the top, biomass, total biomass in the middle, abundance and rich richness in the uh, in the bottom bottom graph. And this was this was across a, a range of different flies. This was across uh, midges, mosquitoes. And I can't remember what the other group was, um, but yeah, it, it's a it's a constant effect across across all of them. Changes in body size, as I mentioned earlier, there's a strong relationship between temperature and body size in animals. And this study uh, looked at museum specimens of dragonflies and related wing size to historical climate climatic conditions. Uh, and they found that there were decreases in wing length for many species, which correlated with increases in spring and autumn temperatures. So we can see here we've got um, uh, some damselflies here on the top graph, which is the the spring temperatures. You can see that they're all in decline. Uh, the the, the not, their body size is is, is um, smaller um, as temperature is uh, the greater the temperature is. And that's a, it's a fairly standard effect across all the species um, that were, were studied. We also have that a change in body size as, uh, in, as species as you go further north. And again, it's linked to temperature um, because northern temperature, northern latitudes are, are, are cooler. And we can see here that as you move north, but in these two species of, of damselfly, um, which is the azure damselfly and the large red damselfly, we can see the further north you go, the, the larger the specimens are. So moving on to um, how vulnerable are insects to, to climate change, the, there's been lots of studies that have looked at how to assess the, the vulnerability of aquatic insects to climate change. Um, 
and they're they're mostly based on traits uh, of those insects and and their preferences and and where they live. And I'd like to take you through. I now like to take you through the process that we used in the UK to to look at this. This is uh, uh, from a paper that we published um, last year on vulnerability of aquatic insects. Um, we looked for traits that made species more vulnerable to warming temperatures, uh, water temperatures, and these related to the fragility of their habitats, um, uh, such as these headwater streams that we can see in the, the upper pictures there, their cold tolerance. Um, so if they were a cold stenothem, something that, you know, preferred cold water, um, that would make them more vulnerable to warming of that water. Their dispersal ability, um, aspects of the life cycle, like, like how long their flight period was, a species that has a very short flight period um, needs that flight period to be right for them, the, the, the conditions to be right in that flight period. A longer one can, can vary its, uh, its emergence to, to get the right conditions. And finally, we looked at how isolated the species populations were. So a, a species that is isolated from other populations is going to have uh, more trouble, you know, dispersing and adapting to changes to their habitat. So these are the, the traits that we selected. So we looked at their preference for where they lived in the stream, and we focused on species that were primarily found in headwaters. Um, we looked at their altitudinal preference because we know that species at higher altitudes are are more cold adapted um, and therefore would be affected by by warmer temperatures. So we looked at species that were found predominantly above 450 meters above sea level. We looked at cold stenotherm species, so those cold adapted species that would be uh, by nature more vulnerable to warmer conditions. We looked at species with a short flight period, um, so less than around two months, um, because they would have less flexibility in their life cycle to adapt to, to the changing uh, climatic conditions. And we also looked at species that were living for a year or more, so not the very short lived species, which were also able to adapt more, more easily. But species, so some of the, some of the um, stoneflies live for up to three and a half years and are therefore you know, stuck with the conditions that they're living in um, for that period. So the, a species that is able to develop quicker are more likely to be able to adapt to climatic conditions faster. And then we looked at the restricted distribution. So we looked at species that have been classified as nationally rare, which is less than 15 hectares across the UK. We're really fortunate in Europe to have a, a database uh, which has a, a lot of this information in it. Um, Freshwaterecology.info um, uh, has a huge number of, uh, of traits information and preferences. It's got uh, quite detailed information on, on tolerances of some of these species as well and just what makes them tick. So we were able to extract relevant information from, from this website and analyze it to determine the overall vulnerability of mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, which are the groups with the most information uh, available. The results show that stoneflies are the most vulnerable order, um, followed by caddisflies and then mayflies. Yeah, that's not surprising because a lot of the stoneflies are cold stenotherms and they're, they're adapted to colder conditions and, and fast flowing cool water. Life cycle is the trait that drives much of the vulnerability, um, followed by flight period and then their, their longitudinal preference, where they like to live in the, in the, in the river, in the water course. Using that information, we were able to identify a group of 14 species. So out of the 290 uh, species found in the UK in these groups, we identified 14 species that are particularly vulnerable to climate change. As I said, the majority are stoneflies and include species such as Diura bicordata and Potanamura montana, which are high altitude cold stenotherm species that live in small streams. Um, the, but it also includes species such as Namura erratica and Leuctra moselii, which are more lowland species. And, and were a bit of a surprise, to be, if I'm honest, that you know it wasn't something that uh, we, we initially thought would be 
we didn't think those species would be particularly vulnerable, but but the the, the conditions that they live in are uh, would suggest that they are. There are some species here that um, are on the edge of extinction already. Capnia vidua is incredibly rare in the UK, and the Caddisfly glottosoma intermedium we think is possibly extinct already. Um, and and initially we you know initial thoughts were that that was to do with um, pollution with sheep dip pollution but actually now that we have done this analysis we could probably point to climate change as, as a contributing factor so where are these species um well we use nearly 600,000 records of mayflies stoneflies and caddisflies from the recording schemes to map the location of the most vulnerable species the left hand map shows the distribution of the number of vulnerable species so this is just uh, purely how many are in a in a a catchment um, and the uh, right hand map shows the vulnerability of individual sub catchments uh, water catchments across the UK. So some of the most vulnerable species are found in the high altitude areas such as the Cairngorms in Scotland, the Lake District in, in England and Snowdonia in Wales. And But you can also see that there's quite a spread of, of vulnerability in the catchments in lowland areas as well. Um, the it it's it's a use this is I mean the use for this is to actually be able to target where we should be looking to put in mitigation which I'll talk about later on so what what are the next steps with this research well um we're conscious that we've only really looked at the adult life cycle um and we know that some species are, are more susceptible to temperature changes in in uh, other parts of the life cycle. So for instance, stoneflies, there's been a lot of work done by uh, Malcolm Elliott on stonefly temperature preferences and the optimal temperatures for stonefly egg in incubation. Um, and you know this, this gives us some very, very neat information about how vulnerable, how, how, uh, uh, how stonefly species may be affected by temperature. You can see the majority of species require temperatures of less than 10 degrees for their eggs to develop successfully. Um, and that might suggest that we, we need to uh, look at more of those species as indicators of, of climate change. We've also worked with um, Marine Scotland to, uh, to add to their Scot Scottish River temperature monitoring network. They have a, an, a, a network of data loggers across Scotland and they collect data from them to to in to indicate where there are there are particular hot spots um that's a really bad pun but um warm areas uh for for uh, um primarily primarily they were looking at it for salmon um migration but we worked with them to put in some uh metrics for them to use that would look at the uh, impact on invertebrates as well and these were things such as um, the the tolerances, the thermal tolerances for cold stenotherm species, and then for stonefly eggs as well. So we can now go on and we can use we can uh, look at their data from an invertebrate point of view, not just as a, a fish point of view. So I'd like to finish off with a, a case study of one of those vulnerable species. This is the upland summer mayfly, Amelitus inopinatus, um, which is found, it's a widespread species, it's found across Europe and in North America, uh, but in the UK it's the only Arctic alpine relic species that we have. It's typically found in upland areas and in, in the north, in northern uh, areas of the UK, it's in, in the it's typically, as I say, in, in upland areas and high altitudes um, on mountainous areas. But in Scotland, it has been found closer to the sea level in the past, and that because of cooler temperatures in the in the far north. It's generally restricted to uh, the northern western parts. Uh, it is also found in Ireland, but those records aren't shown here. It lives predominantly in smaller watercourses, like the one shown on this slide. It can also be found in pools and eddies in larger streams, and particularly under the bank, where you know where there's there's plenty of sh shading. There's 
the, these are really harsh habitats. Um, this is a photo of a stream with Amelitis in the spring, that, that previous photo. This is the same stream in the winter when it becomes snowbound. So the, the stream's still there. It's probably barely flowing. Um, there'll, there'll be pools that the uh, insects are living in underneath that snow. Um, and even the larger streams, in, in some years, even the larger streams will, will be covered in ice at times as well. So these are really, really harsh um, habitats, uh, but that's what they need to, to, to develop, as we'll show in a minute. In 2011, Tobman et al. looked at the likely distribution of the species under different climate scenarios, and their findings were rather shocking, showing that by 2080, uh, Amelitis could be lost from much of its European range. They predicted that that the warmer water temperatures would push this species further and further upstream into the hills until it eventually runs out of space. The top map shows the current distribution um, and the bottom map shows the predicted distribution in 2018. And you can see that from being uh, a widespread species in, in Northern Europe, it's, 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 it's um, predicted to be restricted to the Cairngorms in Scotland, Scandinavia, and parts of the Alps. So we, what we did was we set out to ground truth some of these findings by looking at the current status of Amelitis populations in Great Britain. Um, I'm going to focus on one particular site that we we worked on, which is at uh, Glenshee. Um, Glenshee is a ski set, a ski skiing area in Scotland. It's in the south of the Cairngorms National Park. Um, and it's it's got good access, which is one of the reasons why we we picked it. Um, but it's also got some really small streams and some uh, and a good population of Amelitis, at least in part of the the catchment. We focused our studies on at the, the very top of the catchment. So this is the ski centre here, um, and you can see that the, it's an, on the watershed of the D and the T. The the D um, flows to the north and the Tay flows southwards um, down towards Dundee on the coast. The streams here are, are, are really tiny headwaters and they rely heavily on snow melt and rain to keep them flowing. Um, there's not much subsurface flow, they're, they're pretty much on bedrock um, here, but these, these are the sort of streams that we get in this area uh, that Amelitis lives in. In winter, there can be significant snowfall, um, not every year, but most years. Um, and that covers the stream, as I've shown before, and, and the stream flow reduces to a trickle at that point coming out of the, out of the snow bed. Um, in the summer, the stream dries up with isolated pools forming in deeper areas. So it stops flowing, but there's still pools there. Um, so it really is, like I said, it's a really harsh habitat that this species lives in. We had a look at the relationship between air temperature and water temperature, and we placed a series of data loggers in the streams to record water temperature. And then there's a, there's a, we're fortunate that there's a, a weather station just close by that we were able to use for the, the air temperature. Um, as you can see, the water temperature follows the air temperature pretty, pretty well. And um, the exception to this is in that, in that period in the middle between February and April, when the water temperature remained fairly stable at around three degrees. And that is due to the, the, the snow cover on the stream, insulating the stream from the, the air temperature. So we're not getting the, the, the decrease in air temperature that we have in other parts of the catchment. Um, other other loggers have show, you know, loggers further down the valley show that that um, temperature uh, uh, continues to drop um, during that period when they're not covered by snow. The other thing that this shows is that when the, the temperature uh, uh, at the very right hand side of this graph is where the temperature matched, um, water temperature matched air temperature. And that's because the, the, the stream had dried up and the, the logger that was in the stream had actually been exposed to the, to the, to the air temperature. So we can see then that in July, um, by July, the stream has dried up. So it's a good indicator of, of when the, what the hydro period of the stream is, when the water is flowing. So we, we collected samples of larvae at the top sites uh, on a monthly basis for a year, uh, but because they were quite small habitats, we only sampled for a minute and only collected small numbers 
of the largest larvae so to indicate the the maximum growth that was possible in this this stream um, we didn't want to destroy the the stream completely and, and the population completely and this graph shows the relationship between the growth of the larvae on the y-axis and the number of degree days on the x-axis and degree days are the number of uh the the amount of temperature the 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 temperature and um, cumulative temperature across a period of time and we can see here that there's a really really clear relationship between the the, the number of degree days and the the growth of the insect um, the the dotted red line shows the point when uh at which the we would class the um, insect to be mature so around about 12 millimeters in in length um, and you can see that is round about um, about 12, 1,275 1, um, degree, degree days. We can also take the information from the loggers and then look at the degree days um, from them. And these are the three water courses at the top of the catchment. Um, the, um, the blue line is the south flowing stream, which you can see increases steadily throughout the year. And during the, the summer, we found that this stream is as much as four degrees warmer than the North Bloom stream. And that's purely because the sun is on it for longer during the day. Um, the green line is the North Bloom stream at the same altitude as the, the, the South Bloom stream. We can see the effect the much lower temperature has on, on the degree days during the winter. So the, the, uh, during the winter, there's less growth uh, or there's less temperature in that stream. and that's that's when the temperature is the air temperature is below zero and ice is present and but the stream is still exposed to the elements and finally the red line is the highest uh, altitude site where we did our, our growth studies um, and here the stream is blanketed in snow during the winter which means the temperature remains constant and and we see that in this this graph and this allows the mayfly larvae to grow steadily through the winter and emerge at roughly the same time as those from other parts of the stream. The interesting thing is that the, that dotted line is at the point uh, on the graph where uh, mature larvae should be present, and you can see that it just have it just occurs just before the stream starts to dry up. So these these this species is really caught within within that that sort of uh, uh, time scale it needs to get out there before the stream dries up completely and it, it, it its population would fail um one of our big concerns is that the loss of snow cover because of climate change will mean that this stream will get uh will will have slower growth and it won't get to the point uh it needs to in time for the larvae to emerge as adults and um, before the the stream dries up we also revisited some of the sites in the lower uh, tributary. We, we, back in 2012, we did a big survey of the whole area looking at how what the distribution of, of this species was and uh, see where the lower distribution, the lower point of the distribution was on the on the river, um, on the river system. And we found that was at 444 meters above sea level. So it wasn't found down below 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 that altitude. We went back and we had a look again, um, moving up the river, just trying to find the the lower end of the uh, of the distribution again, and uh, we did that ten years later, and we found that it had actually moved upstream um, to uh, by about six hundred and twenty meters uh, along the river corridor, and about sixteen meters in altitude over the last ten years. So we we are able to track we've been able to track the impact that climate change is having on this or climate warming is having on this this species, and that's important because um, because of of uh, the amount of space it has for its population. So this simple graphic just explains that a bit more. So we here here's what it may look like at four hundred meters. You know the population is well spread out along the streams. It's it's across the whole habitat area. Across the whole mountain range, um, as the temperature rises, the insect is pushed further upstream um, to higher elevations. is lost from the lowlands, 
as we go further, it would get pushed for, uh, up and you can start to see that the, the population is becoming fragmented. There's, there's three hilltops there that they're, they're on. And as that happens, uh, again, it becomes more and more isolated until you're down to a very small population size or you lose them altogether. So what does that mean for this population? Well, if we consider the area of land above different altitudes, we can see how much potential habitat might be available. At the moment, we're on the second scenario in this, this slide, where the species is only known from above 450 metres in this area. Um, that means that around 60% of the, of the water courses in that area are theoretically suitable um, for, that, for that species. Um, much of the main river channels are excluded, um, but around 79 kilometres of, of, um, of the tributaries are, are, are available. At the current rate of contraction, we'll move towards the third scenario by 2080. And here we'll, we'll be down to about 26% of the watercourses um, in the area suitable. So we've got a we've got a, a ticking time bomb if you like of, of for this species that it's it's going to run out of land and, and water um in in the next sort of 50 years extrapolating that out across scotland we can see that many of the areas of suitable habitat will become fragmented and isolated which may also exacerbate the decline of populations in this mayfly particularly in the south of scotland where we can see that it it will it could well be wiped out completely. So what can we do? Well, fortunately, there is some mitigation that we can use to help slow this process. Um, we know that shaded water courses remain cooler for longer. And if we plant trees along water courses that are more likely to have increases in water temperature, then we can keep them cooler for longer. These maps show river temperature predictions uh, based on those loggers I was talking to you about uh, with Marine Scotland loggers. Um, these are placed in rivers across the country and it shows on the left-hand side that maximum daily river temperatures range between 15 and 25 degrees in the, with the warmest conditions in the north of the country. Um, the right-hand map shows what the effects of a one degree rise in air temperature would be on water temperature. And you can see again, it's the north and the west of the country that are most affected. So that's a place to start uh, focusing our, our mitigation action on um, for this species. But now that we've identified where we should deploy this mitigation, what would it actually look like? Um, well, it's not about creating a continuous screen of trees. That's, that's, that's not what we're, we're looking for. We're actually looking for some dappled shade on, this, on the water course um, so that there's light getting in there because light dries a lot of the processes in the, in the river. And certainly um, mayflies and stoneflies need um, some, some algal growth to, to feed upon um, when, they're, when they're in the river as larvae. So it's about creating blocks of trees along the river um, dependent on what where the conditions on the site are, for instance, the orientation of the water course or what natural shading there might be from hill hills and and the like, you know. So, in a you can see here that there's different conditions for whether you've got a east west flowing river or a north south flowing river. Um, but yeah, the idea is to have dappled shade rather than complete shade. University of Aberdeen have been taking this a step further and looking to fine tune thermal models of rivers so that we know the best places um, to target some of that riparian planting. They've been using thermal cameras on drones to fly over stretches of rivers to identify areas of warmer and cooler water. And the, the resultant map shown here shows areas of cold water in blue. For example, the, the, there's spots where there could be groundwater upwelling um, on the river in the river bed. Um, or the tributaries that are coming in that are bringing in cool, cooler water. And they also show areas of warmer water in yellow, which is perhaps shallower areas or more exposed areas. And you'd want to target some of your efforts to those yellow areas rather than uh, the cooler areas um, in the first instance. And this is what it looks like in practice. This is um, some riparian planning which was undertaken 
on the river Mick, the upper river Mick in the Cairngorms uh, as part of the Pearls and Peril project. Um, so this was put in to help pearl mussels and salmon populations, but it's perfect for amylitis as well. Um, it has to be in the right place and it has to be the right tree in the right place uh, to make sure that we get that, that winter sunshine that, that drives the life in the river um, over that period. And, and you know, is essential to the development of, of mayflies and stoneflies. Fortunately, there's some good um, uh, guidance on this. So there's been the Woodland Trust published the Keeping Rivers Cool um, guidance manual, and then the EA have also done a, a, a similar same same title, Keeping Rivers Cool, but one about uh, how to how how to target this as well. So there's good information out there for for people to use if they're they're managing rivers. Um, this is the site in Glenshee that I was talking about. This is just the, the just downstream of here is where the, the lower limit of the Amelitis population is in this, this river. And you can see that there's been some planting put along alongside here. So it, it, it's clear that Amelitis and Opinatus, uh, the upland summer mayfly is being adversely affected by water temperatures. And we've seen range contractions or even the complete loss of the species in some areas. And what we what we need to do is to keep the 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 streams cool in the summer. Um, that, that's the, the most important thing. Um, and to prevent the water temperature from rising too much. And this this you know riparian planting is is the the most effective technique at the moment that we know of um, to do that. It's going to take a long time. Um, for these trees to mature and to give the shading that is needed. And we probably should have started doing this 30, 40 years ago. Um, but the hope is that we'll buy this species uh, and, and others a little bit of time by shading, shading these streams. We also now understand that snow cover is essential for populations at the highest altitudes um, to allow them to develop, continue developing through the winter and allowing them to merge before the streams stop flowing. And you know it's a big concern that you know our our the amount of snow that we're getting in the UK is decreasing, and you know that's going to have a massive effect on on species in these in these rivers. It's incredibly important that we keep monitoring these populations and and other populations of other aquatic in, invertebrates, and you know it's something that Bug Life has been involved with for a long time through the River Fly Partnership, and the River Fly Partnership. Uh, are uh, a, a partnership of, of organizations that come together to promote monitoring of river flies and their conservation. And Bug Life is currently running a project called Gardens of Our Rivers, which is looking to develop um, river fly partnership monitoring across Scotland. Um, and hopefully we'll also be helping with stuff in other parts of the UK. So it's, it's something that's dead easy to do. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good way of getting out and finding out more about your river. And if you're interested, please do get in touch. We'll continue to monitor the, the population of Amelitis and Opinatus in, in these streams and others um, in the meantime. And we hope that we'll get landowners um, involved in, in implementing mitigation measures to help save as many populations of the species as possible. Just a couple of final words, um, just to summarize the whole talk. Um, so freshwater insects are, are at increased risk of climate change. We've seen that through various studies showing the, the effects on their distribution, on their phenology, on their abundance and biomass. Um, we've found that species in the uplands and headwaters are most at risk um, because that's where the climate, uh, the changes that, that happen with climate change are going to impact uh, worse. Um, time is running out for these freshwater insects. You know, we that example of um, of Amelitis and Opinatus, it, it, we, we should have started a long time ago thinking about how we can help this species and time really is running out for it. We need to put mitigation measures in place and we need to get that uh, rolling out at scale as soon as possible. Um, but we need to target it to give the biggest benefits. So we can't just put, put trees everywhere. Let's make sure that we, we target where we put them to, to uh, help the most populations. And then finally, monitoring is essential so that we understand what's happening and how 
how changes are, uh, how our mitigation is helping or where there are uh, increased pressures. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that and thank you for listening. If you'd like further in, any information on this work or anything else that I've I mentioned in the talk, please do get in touch with me by email and I'm also on Twitter if you want to engage there as well. Thank you.